If you imagine an American Roman Catholic priest in the middle of the 20th century, you might think of a cleric in vestments saying Mass in Latin. Can you imagine that same man writing and directing a musical extravaganza with over a thousand performers called Light Up the Land? man was Daniel Lord. In his 30-year career from 1925 to 1955, he did more than any other American Catholic religious figure. He wrote plays, books, pamphlets, and books for children. He lectured and gave retreats. He organized the Sodality Movement at Catholic parishes and schools. He wrote the controversial 1930 Motion Picture Production Code he even wrote an encyclical for the Pope and helped the famous Hollywood producer Cecil B. DeMille make a movie about Jesus. And he did much more. As one colleague said about Daniel Lord, every time you think you have a list of the things he does, you find out you've left out about half of them. The answers to the problems of the world are very simple. It's love, that's it. An unloved child is a child who grows up to be a broken adult or a criminal. An unloved nation is a nation by that very fact that is doomed to become a problem nation across the world. A class of people who are downtrodden eventually will rise up and take over as they did in Haiti and bathe the land and the blood of the people whom they have been taught to hate. We don't have to begin with a national problem. We begin right down inside ourselves. We have no right to deny to any man those things that we want for ourselves. We have no right to decide a class or a race or a nation or a color or a creed by the very fact that they belong to it, have no right to these things. And we have an obligation, we Catholics, of supporting everything that sees to it that the God-given decencies of life be given to as many people as possible. If we do that, we shall have no worries about the future. Uh, the man had both the expansive vision of what the church might be and what it might be in the realm of public relations and publicity and publications, before TV really, and in the realm of dealing one-on-one -on -one with persons, giving them some sense of what Jesus was about. He was born in April 1888 in Chicago to George and Iva Jane Lord. The infant was named after his paternal grandfather, Daniel Lord, a Presbyterian minister. As a young woman, Iva Jane worked in a fashionable glove shop. One day the shop received a shipment of blue-gray, mud-colored gloves from England. When they did not sell, Iva suggested a window display with a sign reading, The newest color from London, Moonlight on the Lake. The gloves sold out in a day. This was the first of many examples of Iva's business acumen. Lord's only sibling, James, was born in October 1891. In the summer of 1893, the young Daniel and his grandfather, after whom he was named, toured the World's Columbian Exposition, the World's Fair. As Lord would later write, all the time he laughed and talked, paying me that greatest possible compliment one can pay to a child, the compliment of remembering he is and pretending he isn't. Lord attended Holy Angels Grade School, where Sister Mary Blanche introduced Lord to the Sodality Club. At confirmation, Lord took the name of Aloysius, which became his middle name. In 1901, Daniel entered the combined Jesuit high school and college St. Ignatius. When a neighbor heard the news, he taunted Lord's father. Why in thunder do you let your boy go to that place? The only thing they turn out there are priests and ball players. Well, said George, if my son makes good either, that won't be such a bad life. 
A brilliant cigar-smoking Jesuit, Claude Pernan, had a great influence on Daniel and encouraged Lord's writing and interest in theater. As Lord later wrote, for me his classroom, his lecture hall, his academia and peripatetic grove remains in my memory a smoke-filled living room on the third floor of musty old St. Ignatius. The front of his cassock, then and always, was covered with a cascade of tobacco ash. Lord graduated in 1909. His college buddies hammed it up for a photograph. That summer, Lord entered the Jesuits at St. Stanislaus Seminary in the small village of Florissant outside of St. Louis, Missouri. He began two years of training called the Novitiate. The rock building of the seminary still stands. In 1913, on a picnic, Lord drank water from a contaminated well. He and 18 other Jesuits came down with typhoid. Due to his slow recovery, Lord was pulled from his studies to go to work with Father Edward Garrichet, who had just become the national director of the Jesuit Sodality Movement. Sodalities were clubs to encourage religious faith at Catholic parishes and schools. Lord helped Garrichet launch its magazine, The Queen's Work, named for Mary, the mother of Jesus and the Queen of Heaven. The Queen's work included several of Lord's clever short stories, such as The Lightning Artist and The Ironic Column, How a Bulky Elevator Helped Bernice Fairfield, advisor of the Lovelorn, to bring romance into the lives of Hiram and Anastasia. He returned to his studies in philosophy. In 1917, he published his first book, Armchair Philosophy. Between 1917 and 1920, he did three years of teaching at the Jesuit University in St. Louis. He started the student newspaper, restarted the yearbook, wrote and produced three musicals, started the student council, ran the student army training corps, and caught and survived the Spanish flu. He also fell in love. Troubled, Daniel Lord talked to a trusted Catholic nun, after which Lord broke it off with the young woman. And so, this story continues. In 1920, Lord began four years of the study of theology. In 1922, he caught and survived tuberculosis. In the early 1920s, Lord visited several dozen convents, schools, and institutions run by Catholic sisters. He wrote a series of articles in the Queen's work, which were published as his book, Our Nuns, which gives a fascinating look into the work of Catholic sisters of the time. Lord was ordained in 1923. In 1925, Lord was sent to St. Louis to take over the struggling Sodality movement and its magazine. Lord rewrote the Sodality Manual and then started traveling the country to revitalize old Sodalities and create new ones. In the fall of 1926, Lord traveled to California to serve as technical advisor for Cecil B. DeMille's silent movie, The King of Kings on the Life of Jesus. DeMille and Lord became lifelong friends Lord's main contribution to the film was to reduce the footage on Mary Magdalene prior to her conversion. One Sunday, Lord said Mass on the set using the workbench in the carpenter shop of Jesus. H.B. Warner as Jesus stood in front. What other priest can claim that he said Mass with Jesus in the front row? Did anyone joke about Lord giving communion to the Lord? Lord wrote the controversial 1930 Motion Picture Production Code. For years, Lord had been concerned about the content of movies. His Jesuit friend, Fitzgeorge Deneen, in Chicago, had organized boycotts of local theaters. By coincidence, Cardinal George Mundelein in Chicago had regular lunches with prominent bankers who, because of the 1929 financial collapse, now owned the movie companies. 
Lord wound up writing the code, which because of Mundelein's influence was accepted by the Hollywood producers afraid of state and federal censorship. Lord wanted movies that did not glorify and encourage immorality and crime. As movie producer Jack Warner candidly admitted to Lord, Whenever my directors are stuck for something to do, they make the heroine take off her clothes. When the code failed to change the movies, Lord wrote his next pamphlet. Lord then helped support the Legion of Decency, which rated movies. Lord's Queen's Work magazine published the ratings. In 1931, Lord started a week-long conference called the Summer School of Catholic Action, the SSCA, for college students, sisters, priests, and brothers. These popular conferences would last until 1968. The SSCA slogan was, Six Days You'll Never Forget. The SSCA provided a unique opportunity for priests, sisters, and lay people to work together as equals to promote Catholic action. Such opportunities did not exist in many Catholic institutions. Lord even wrote the SSCA theme song for Christ the King, also known as An Army of Youth. An army of youth claim the standards of truth. We're fighting for Christ the Lord. Heads lifted high, Catholic action a cry, and the cross our only sword. Over the years, Lord's mother, Iva Jane, had been investing in real estate. She and George moved from one apartment building to another as she bought and sold. When Iva died in October 1933, Daniel Lord went through her orderly accounts. Through her real estate investing, Iva Jane left behind $70,000, an immense sum in the middle of the Depression. A year later, Daniel Lord wrote Iva Jane a tribute, the book My Mother. The famous Hollywood producer, John Considine, even considered making a movie of the story. In the January 1931 issue of the Queen's Work magazine, Joe College first appeared in a dialogue with his friend Chick Hagan. Chick would express his criticism of everything Catholic, and Joe would defend his faith on issues such as the Latin Mass, the role of priests, intolerant Catholics, and purgatory. In 1935, Joe and Chick appeared in photos. Jane Soff joined them. Listen, Joe, any fool would know that, so I say... You're wrong again, Chick. Fielding average zero. Can't you two ever stop arguing? Chick, if I don't give you an education, who will? <laughs> if you're an educator, Charles Lindbergh's a deep sea diver. Quiet. Has it ever occurred to you that if we three can't get along in peace, we can't expect the world to be peaceful if we're always fighting? I get it. Chick, for the summer months... Let's resolve. If you say anything unpleasant, I won't hear it. If either of you does anything unpleasant, I won't see it. And even if you talk like a nut, I'll keep absolutely mum. Oh, what a peaceful world. In 1936, Daniel Lord sailed to Europe. He would retell his travels in My European Diary. While in Rome, he wrote the papal encyclical on the movies Vigilante Cura. He kept his authorship secret. Under Lord's editorship, the Queen's Work magazine included satirical pieces, humorous articles, and comics.
drawings on the sodality movement, Christmas 1937, why Santa's hair turned white, Catholic action in the Depression, Christmas 1938, which road is right, and Catholic attitudes. You know, Father Lord wrote more than 200 and some pamphlets, which dealt with the whole range of Catholic interests for young and old, rich and poor, urban and rural. In 1925, Lord began writing pamphlets with the story of the little flower on St. Therese of Lisieux. Published just as she was canonized, the pamphlet sold well. It included evocative drawings by Lord's Jesuit friend, Louis Egan. Over the next 30 years, Lord would write 230 pamphlets. Many pamphlets gave advice on how to live life. In many pamphlets, Lord defended and explained religious faith in the Catholic Church. Lord would sell over 25 million pamphlets in the United States. His pamphlets were translated into a dozen languages and many millions were sold and distributed abroad. In a number of pamphlets, Lord became the great American Catholic apologist. Each year, Lord produced a special Christmas pamphlet. And Lord covered all the sacraments Confession is a Joy would sell 340,000 copies. Lord wrote two books and over 20 pamphlets on dating and marriage, many of which were based on his lectures. In his long career, he produced a significant body of widely read literature trying to guide people in picking a spouse and creating a better marriage.
in So We Abolish the Chaperone, a character gives the code of a modern young man escorting a young lady for the evening. Rule one. It's up to the girl. If she wants to be good and is willing to struggle for her goodness, I suppose I'll have to comply with her wishes. If she lets me get away with murder, then it's her responsibility. Rule two. Every young man should find out as soon as possible how much a girl will let him get away with. Rule three. If a girl says no, pretend that she has said yes. No doesn't mean no unless it's accompanied by a persistent and vigorous struggle. Rule four. Chivalry is a fine thing in poetry. It has no place in a taxi cab. Rule five. Knights are as extinct as dragons. Maidens in distress, however, are the normal development of an evening. The character Father Hall proposes a different vision. My new society will start off by reminding the young man that since he is a civilized Christian gentleman, he is supposed to be master of his lower nature. He is not supposed to be a ravening wolf making life difficult for the girl who goes out with him. He is the logical successor of the true knights. Dragons snorting fire and brimstone may all be dead. Dragons snorting cigarette smoke and the fumes of too much alcohol are very, very much alive. Wizards no longer threaten fair maidens. Young men with the charm of a smooth line and a polished approach are quite too common. Edward Dowling on Lord Staff promoted Cana conferences to help married couples. Dowling would also work with alcoholics and be an important influence on Bill Wilson, who started Alcoholics Anonymous. Lord spoke and wrote against communism. Two pamphlets used engaging titles. The answer to communism is Christian democracy, and until we are willing to live like Christians and act like Democrats, we are not going to lick communism. Every time a neighborhood takes an attitude of hatred or bigotry toward a racial group or a, a minority group, we are just handing the communists a ready-made victory on the battlefield. Lord made hundreds of radio broadcasts, and for 20 years his weekly column, Along the Way, was syndicated in diocesan newspapers across the country. Lord's 1933 Religion and Leadership became a popular textbook for college freshmen and was used into the 1950s. In 1943, Lord took over the Jesuit Institute for Social Order, the ISO. Lord envisioned an ambitious plan to educate Jesuits about Catholic social teaching who would in turn educate Catholics. However, Lord's vision was too bold and after several years he was removed as head of the ISO. Lord pioneered children's religious literature. Starting in the 1940s, he would produce over 70 children's books and coloring books. Millions of copies were sold. A few are still being sold today. He even wrote a pamphlet on child safety. Lord also published cutouts, the Solemn High Mass, St. Bernadette of Lourdes, Columbus Lands in America, and These Are Our Martyrs with a Colosseum, soldiers, lions, and Christians about to be devoured. Lord wrote pamphlets on church behavior, politeness in the pews, every parish has them, and, oh, not in my pew. With limericks, poems, and cartoons, he described the Sunday Stampeders leaving Mass, Gossipy Gladys, Larry the Lay Curate, Catch a Drag Claudy, and the sprinter in the dark. 
deep in the shadow of the pew has crouched the penitent. His soul is wet with deep regret, his head in sorrow bent. But let the priest approach the box, a whiz, a swoosh, a lunge, the line he'll toss for quite a loss, making his halfbacks plunge. Today it is hard to imagine the size of the sodality movement in Lord's time. In the 1940s, 13,000 sodalities existed at Catholic high schools, colleges, and parishes. Many parishes had a men's sodality and a woman's sodality. There were even nurses' sodalities. Sodalities with 50 to 100 members were common. For 30 years, Lord traveled constantly, visiting parishes, Catholic grade schools, high schools, and colleges. Very likely, he met and talked with more Catholic young men and women than any other person. If Dan Lord were alive today in 2017, he would definitely have a Facebook page and a Twitter account, and he would be using them constantly to evangelize young people. Father Lord's Jesuit colleague, uh, Father Walter J. Ong, the great uh, scholar, would later theorize about mass communication and media, but Father Lord actually used these various forms of media and communication to attract young people to the Catholic faith. Countless young men and women chose vocations because of his writings, lectures, and personal correspondence. In his travels, lectures, and conferences, it is also likely that Daniel Lord got to know more Catholic sisters than any other figure. Lord often called for a bigger role for women religious in the work of the church. In the 1940s and 50s, he called for coordinating organizations of the mother superiors of different orders, and he pushed for relaxing traditional rules so sisters could adapt to modern times. In 1947, he wrote Letters to a Nun, and in 1951, he wrote his play, Every Nun, in which an elderly sister looks back on the many accomplishments of her life. As his Jesuit colleague, Edward Dowling, once said, the greatest thing Father Lord ever did was to discover the American nun. The Queen's work was the name of the Sodality magazine, but also the name of Lord's operation, which printed and distributed millions of pamphlets, booklets, books, and countless letters and mailings to support sodalities across the country. Financed in part by the sale of pamphlets, Lord built up his staff. Lord never understood racial and ethnic hatred and spent his career fighting prejudice. Lord ignored hotel policies and African Americans attended sodality conferences. The Jesuit John Lafarge, the leading Catholic voice for interracial justice, frequently spoke at sodality conferences. In segregated St. Louis, Lord produced shows that addressed racism, including a song from Lord's 1936 Social Order Follies, White Man, What's My Place? In 1937, Lord wrote the pamphlet, Dare We Hate Jews. In his lifetime, Daniel Lord wrote some 70 plays, musicals, and pageants. He wrote three while in college, International Minstrels, The Night of the Prom, and The S.S. Buster of the White Star Line with a Happy Ending. Five years later, White Star sent out The Titanic. While teaching during World War I, he wrote Over and Back and Rouge and Rapid Fire, about soldiers behind the lines preparing a show to entertain the troops. 
When word comes that their buddies have been captured, they leave the stage to rescue them from the Germans. In the 20s and 30s, Lard wrote a dozen small plays that were widely produced at Catholic grade schools and high schools. Lord played a key role in the Catholic theater movement to encourage amateur theater at schools and parishes. He produced most of his plays. In Lord's 1928 play, A Fantasy of the Passion, a dying man dreams that he himself crowned Jesus with thorns because of his own sins. Written in turbulent times, Lord's 1936 drama, Storm Tossed, explored Catholic social teaching on the rights of workers. In 1937, Lord wrote and produced The Restless Flame for Marquette University in Milwaukee, a tribute to great explorers from Odysseus when Circe turned his men into animals, to Marco Polo in China, to Hernan Cortez in the Aztecs, to the Jesuit Jacques Marquette who explored the Mississippi in the 1600s. And in 1937, Lord also produced Jamaica Triumphant. Jamaica was portrayed as a woman. Lord's 1940 election year follies included scenes such as, we've got the vote. Honey, you get my vote. The nine old men on the Supreme Court. An Irish Catholic O'Reilly running for president. And a song by members of the African-American St. Elizabeth's Parish, It's My Country Too. Lord filled his plays with Crusader Knights, Vikings, Aztec demon dancers, dancers with scimitars, bandits with scimitars, and bandits on horseback attacking the Holy Family. Lord's 1951 tribute to Detroit City of Freedom was seen by over 150,000 people and was popular with Catholic sisters. In 1952, Lord created his musical Light Up the Land for the Jesuit University of Detroit with over a thousand performers. A film version was produced with Daniel Lord introducing the movie. Oh, hello everybody. Nice to see you backstage. There's quite an audience waiting outside, of course, in the Fieldhouse Memorial Building here. But as a director, I always think the backstage is the interesting spot. And, of course, I am the lucky director of this particular production. The production is, of course, Light Up the Land. The University of Detroit, for whom this particular show was written, is presenting it as the opening of its beautiful new memorial building. Father Celestin Steiner, who is the president of the university and just about the bravest man that I know, had made up his mind that the opening of this magnificent memorial building should be used as an occasion to tell the people the importance of education to democracy and how if education succeeds, democracy succeeds, and how if one fails, the other fails too. During the course of the evening, we'd like to show you a little bit about how we assemble a cast of this kind, the community elements that go into it, why it isn't just a university project, but a project that is shared by a great many people, how it's done, why it's done. Because you see, we've done this kind of thing all over the United States and in foreign countries too. 
these big shows like Light Up the Land. And in every case, there is an effort being made to unite education and the community, town and gone, in the presentation of what we hope will be something that's very new and fresh and exciting and interesting. A fine piece of art in which a lot of people cooperate. And Light Up the Land is one of these projects. Music, of course, is essential for atmosphere, background, and mood. Mary McDonald takes it down as I write it. Great Detroit musicians will sing and perform it. Lord gave advice for working with amateurs. Anybody can act well for one minute. Anybody can do a part that pleases an audience for 30 seconds. Build your show out of one minute and 30 second bits. Dancing was a key element of his musicals. He included Del Sartre scenes, dancing Charlie Chaplin's, the dance of cholera and death, the dance of the machine, ballet dancers, even cyclists and basketball players. Father Dan Lord had more effect on the lives of ordinary Catholics during the early and middle portion of the 20th century than any other person, alive or dead. In January 1954, doctors discovered that Lord had lung cancer, although he was not a smoker. He continued to write and travel. St. Ignatius was playing billiards. He's the founder of the Jesuits, with some of his associates. And one of them said, if you knew in 15 minutes' time that you were going to die, what would you do? St. Ignatius said, I'd finish the billiard game. And I think that's the answer. Finish your billiard game. He wrote a short pamphlet, My Good Angel of Death, Reflection on his doctor's diagnosis of cancer. His illness received national attention. But I had one man who wrote to me and said, that if for the rest of my life I would drink nothing but carrot juice, I'd live. I preferred to die. In October, he went to Toronto to produce his Marion Year pageant, Despite the Ravages of Cancer. He directed the show from a cot. A local newspaper ran the headline, Show must go on. Producer probably will not. He spent the last months of his life in St. John's Hospital in St. Louis. Using a dictaphone, he wrote his autobiography, Played by Ear. In his final days, delirious, he imagined he was still giving stage directions. Get going on this right away. Step it up. 
Hurry, hurry. After his year-long fight with cancer, Daniel Lord S.J. died on January 15, 1955. Visitors, nuns, priests, and doctors knelt in the halls of the hospital. Many believed a saint had just died. He was buried at St. Stanislaus Seminary, where he had entered the Jesuits 45 years earlier. In the 1970s, he and his fellow Jesuits were moved to Calvary Cemetery.